Here we go. It's the uh, WTOP huddle. Yes, we got George Wallace, Rob Woodford, Chris Chihon, and uh, direct from West Palm Beach, Florida. That's just great to say. Is Dave Preston covering the Nationals? Of course, our Nationals report on WTOP presented to you by Main Street Bank. Dave, you look terrific, even though you're working 24 hours a day. <laughs> you're in morning drive with me. You're all over the day with George Wallace and then uh, Scott Jackson, whoever's working tonight. We're hearing you because clearly you're not sleeping. You're not sleeping. You're working. And you've got the Moody Blues commemorative T-shirt. So we appreciate that touch <laughs> to the WTLP huddle. But again, we appreciate the, our support of Main Street Bank as uh, it is spring training time. We will begin with that. And we will begin with you, Mr. Preston, so far. Uh, beyond the palm trees and the pool, which you have no chance of seeing, what has stood out for you in Florida? Well, I did do a cannonball after my 115 report with George Wallace earlier today for the record. <laughs> True. Uh, you know, and, and we, what's amusing is that as we say during uh, Washington football team season, you can't start 5 8 and 3 if you don't go 0 1 and 1. They tied the opener to the exhibition season on Sunday. They lost yesterday. But what you want to see as opposed to wins and losses, you want to see Guys getting their work in. Ryan Zimmerman had a home run yesterday. You saw Carter Keeboom uh, play. Uh, you know, look good in, uh, in in his work out there defensively. Uh, Josh Harrison, uh, two for three yesterday at the plate, uh, drove in a pair, had a home run in the rally as well. So we're, we're seeing positives as this team is slowly but surely ramping up to where the regulars are going to be able to play nine innings on opening day. Is, is Carter Keeboom uh, such a big focus for this uh, camp, because I, I hear Davey Martinez said we'll be a better club if he's able to win that third base job. I think there are two major focal points for this lineup when you look at what they can do and what they need to do, where their ceiling might be. I think one is, yes, Carter Keeboom needs to be a solid back of the lineup guy where he bats sixth, seventh, or eighth, wherever, but he needs to hit 250, 260, 270 with some extra base hits as opposed to last year where he hit low 200s, I think 202. He had just one extra base hit, struck out a ton, did not walk nearly as much as you would have hoped he would have. He had LASIK surgery in the offseason. Uh, the uh, hitting coach Kevin Long told us in an interview earlier on Tuesday. So I, I think his ability not to be a spectacular third baseman, to be a, but to be a solid third baseman will be huge for this lineup. Another factor, can Victor Robles lead off? Kevin Long thinks he can. He's got to be able to, uh, you know, to, to be a, a little bit better atop the order and not strike out as much. But if Robles is able to hit atop the order, that pushes everybody down and you have Trey Turner batting with runners on base and in scoring position. You have a Trey Turner on base when Juan Soto's up. There's a residual ripple effect here. Yeah, indeed. Carter Keeboom has to hit above the uh, Mendoza line, and he says he's adjusted his uh, swing. Uh, all right, George, uh, any questions for Mr. Preston beyond his falsified uh, expense reports or what else, or, or as we get this baseball talk going? Yeah, uh, the first of all, the cannonball sounded great on the air. The water splashed was great uh, in the background. I'll, I'll give you a 10 on that one. Uh, you look, a lot of the, you know, some question marks, obviously, with this team, and I think uh, other than pitching, I'll let somebody else get to that. Let's talk about Ryan Zimmerman, obviously opting out last year. He went through spring training 1.0 last year, but then not uh, th throughout the second part of the season, opting out. First uh, first game back, hit a home run, walked, played some first base, said he was going to be pretty sore. Uh, David Martinez sounded pretty encouraged from what he saw. I know it's one, but this is his 16th uh, spring. Uh, any kind of feel for how Ryan Zimmerman's feeling and, and be back? I mean, do you think well, he – they're going to be able to count on him uh, this season. I think they'll be able to count on him in the role that they have him set up to be in. Uh, I, you know, um, you know, Josh Bell's the first baseman. He's going to start day yeah. one. Ryan Zimmerman is going to uh, basically see action against lefties. Uh, he's, he's going to start against lefties. He's going to be the DH when they are in an American League city more often than not. He's going to be available mm -hmm. in a pink role, especially against lefty relievers. And I, do I think that – are we expecting Ryan Zimmerman to be a 500 bat, bat guy or maybe even a 400 at bat guy this year? I don't think so. I think they'll use him in bunches. And like in previous years when they were able to put Howie Kendrick uh, and Ryan Zimmerman together and, and 
put together a fairly decent uh, first baseman or move Kendrick over and have him you know, play a lot in second with Brian Dozier and as Drupal Cabrera. Uh, Davey, in a couple of interviews this week, has really talked about how he looks for versatility in his roster. Guys who can play more than one position. Josh Harrison's one of those guys who might be able to morph into part of the uh, at-bats that they will have at first base. So Zim says he feels great. He says he missed being on the clubhouse. It's one thing to say that you feel great on you know March 1st or 2nd. It's another thing to see where your skills have progressed or maybe even regressed uh, once you get into the dog days of summer. But I think that this team and Davey especially is able to manage a veteran ball club. You saw it in 2019. They had the oldest club in baseball. They were able to win the World Series. Instead of fading in August when a lot of older teams might, that's when they actually uh, – found their second gear after catching fire and coming back from 19 and 31. Beginning and they're August. older this year too. They're older. They're older this year too, as they've talked about, which I heard Zim say it's fine. Like they, they know that they know how to play that role. Right. Yeah, just and, because you're older doesn't mean anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting age sensitive now, but uh, as we begin our discussion on WTLB uh, on nationals, we'll go to you next, Chris. And then uh, to you, Rob, as we're talking about a lot of things, including, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like the quarterback competition. We're going to be focusing on that fifth starter. Is it going to be Fetty? Is it going to be both? And then I heard Dave's reports about uh, both having uh, Jim Hickey. Now it's a bullpen session he's going with before. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. Chris, I want you to chime in. So for me, Dave made a point about Victor Robles and hoping that he's going to hit at the top of the order. And I'm not so sure he is your ideal leadoff hitter. I mean, he's not, yes, he can steal bases, but, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. He's not getting on base enough. He strikes out too much. And he's like a big guy. He's not like kind of your prototypical one hitter. I know that a lot of these lineups go a little bit differently. You had Bryce Harper leading off for the Phillies last year. But I just, uh, I think Victor still is coming along here a little bit. Let's not forget, he's a young guy. I always say that I think the peak of a baseball player is kind of the 26, 27 age range. Uh, Ryan Zimmerman homering yesterday, I think that was, uh, or, or Monday, I should say, that was really um, good to see because I've always kind of had my doubts about Josh Bell. I think he's a good hitter. I don't think he's great. I don't think he's a lineup saver. They never really got that big bat along with Trey Turner in the offseason. Um, that the, the replacement for Anthony Rendon, if you will, I still do not think is here. So I do have my concerns with this team, but at the end of the day, the rotation, if it stays healthy, if Max Scherzer doesn't lose a couple mile per hour off his fastball because, or, or hopefully he's has more movement on his pitches because at his age now, Again, I've said it before, this isn't Roger Clemens' steroid era. He needs to, you know, have a little bit more finesse these days. Scherzer, uh, uh, Strasburg being healthy, totally key. He said he was on his way back from the carpal tunnel syndrome. And Patrick Corbin, kind of the X factor. He struggled at times last year. He makes a lot of money. You got to have a bounce back season this year. You got to be that third starter. Because once you get to the postseason, if you can have that one, two, three, this is going to be a tough team to beat. And I like John well, Lester's good. attitude because this seems like it's yeah. going to be fun for him. The pressure is off as he gets thrown into that rotation. Rob? I mean, the thing that I'm obsessed with is this, uh, this new batting order. I mean, Trey Turner has been a mainstay at that leadoff spot. So I'm just fascinated. I mean, just to kind of piggyback off what Chris was saying, I mean, I'm fascinated to see who they're going to select to be the new leadoff guy if you're going to push Trey a little further back in the uh, in the order. I, I, I'm I can't wait to see what Juan Soto is going to do. There's been a lot of talk about whether or not he could be a guy who plays at a level that allows him to be a $400 million guy. I know that that's a little bit further down the road, but um, uh, I'm, I, I just want to see what they do with that top of the order. Now the other, and I don't know how, and I'll get your guys takes on the intangibles work as much in baseball as they, uh, they do other sports. Certainly we think about going from 1931 to the world series and the baby shark and, and all that, that, that something that clubhouse chemistry makes a difference. But a lot of comments, Dave, and you're down there, and maybe that's why you've got a Moody Blues, Blues T-shirt on, but I hear about guys getting in for 6.30 a.m. workouts and the music blaring and, and that vibe that, that Davey Martinez uh, uh, seems to create and encourage. What's your, what's your takeaway from the spirit of this club? Well, I think these guys really missed uh, one another in the offseason because I think last year they never truly had a chance to defend their World Series title. And uh, you had the truncated season, Steven Strasburg's 
here was limited to, I think, just five innings of work. Max Scherzer was not the max that we've known. Same with Patrick Corbin, same with a bunch of the hitters. And I think this is a group that knows how to come together. They came together two years ago last year. Obviously, things did not work as well. And I think when you've got guys who are playing for one another, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We saw that in 2019. We've seen that in other years when you know, they may not have had the best lineup on paper, but they managed to win the National League East. And I think it's 2021 is going to be a very intriguing season because there's a shorter spring training. <clears throat> there's 24 games as opposed to they usually have a little bit longer to ramp up. The, the, uh, the spring training season, it, it's not completely cut, but it's a little bit shorter this year. So. These guys, though, they, you know, they've worked together for years. They're, they're, what's unfortunate, covering the clubhouse this year as opposed to previous years, we don't get the clubhouse access yeah. that we did in last spring training in 2019. When you'd go down for clubhouse, you could feel a positive vibe there. Uh, in other years, 2015, the year that Matt Williams uh, and company, and uh, you know, there, there was uh, a choking in the dugout of Bryce Harper uh, by Jonathan Papelbon. The, the clubhouse temperature felt odd or it didn't feel as though that this was going to be a winning clubhouse so what's unfortunate is that we don't get to feel that this year we we can only hear what we hear and see what we see from a distance that's one thing that i miss is a guy who's uh, covered this team for seven or eight years we don't get our chance to put our toes in the water and really get to feel the vibe of the clubhouse this year talking nats on the wtlb huddle before we move on rob chris george anything else on on our baseball team you want to touch on no, I defer to the man who's down there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a, a collective uh, resounding all, all no. These, all, all these swimming references. We got cannonballs. No. We got dipping our toes in the clubhouse water. Like there's so much, uh, there's so much well, look, references, and it's cold up here. Well, and and his picture yesterday. Don't swim with the alligators. So at least he's not going <laughs> to take that one up and actually do that one. I hope we, we hope not. Hey, as I told George yesterday, you haven't arrived in Florida until you see at least. One, beware of the alligator stuff. Right. Yeah, well, Main Street <laughs> Bank can't bail you out of that. So No, and, and, and make sure it's just the sign you see and not the gator. because they're not Exactly. The Before we move on, Dave, anything else you want to say, Dave Preston, about the Nats and what you're going to be looking forward to in the next few days? Well, the, the uh, again, we've talked about the obvious things to check out. Who starts in that fifth spot of the rotation? Joe Ross, is he even in the equation uh, this year? He opted out of 2020. Uh, right. It's one thing to see what these guys do coming back after not having pitched at all. Uh, another thing, what sort of year will we get from the bullpen? Because the guys in the bullpen did not pitch the innings that they usually pitch in 2020. So it's almost as though they, each of them had shortened seasons last year. Will there, how does that affect their arm strength? How does that affect their arm readiness uh, coming out of the gate in April? And uh, in th th those, I think, how the bullpen performs is going to be a key in April because I think you're still going to see a lot of guys finding their feet as far as the starters, Strasburg coming back, Corbin trying to rewrite the ship, Max Scherzer looking to finish with a flourish. All right. As we wrap up the WTOP huddle, our two minute drill, any topic you want, we'll go to you, George Wallace. What's on your mind? All right. Let's talk Alex Smith. Shall we? <laughs> I don't think it's a surprise. He's going to be released. I see some fans yesterday on Twitter being upset about this. Really? Are you really upset about it? The guy, yes, he started last year and, and got you to where you were, but save $14 million in cap space. This team needs a quarterback. Alex was great for what this team needed last year, but keep in mind, he did not play in the most important game of the year, the playoff game, because he hurt himself three weeks earlier. And his comments to GQ just really, I, I just don't know why he chose to do it at this time. Uh, you made $75 million from this team. They could have cut you, kept you on the pup list at the start of the season last year. And, they, he, and does he forget, no offense to him, that you were coming off a broken leg, 17 surgeries, almost lost your leg. Forgive us if people didn't think you were going to actually come back and play football. Nobody and thought it. Nobody. nobody. And the head coach cut Dwayne Haskins, not you. He chose to keep you and play you. He didn't have to do that. You were the best opportunity chance for this team to win last year, and you got them there. The story's great, but it's time to move on. And I don't think anybody should be surprised. And this team needs the $14 million in cap space 
and needs a quarterback. It's That's not going right. to be Cam Newton, Rob Woodfork. But that fourteen million dollars is going to go right in number one's jersey, baby. <laughs> number one, baby. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that, Rob, go. What's on your mind? Or That's you want, my Tuesday. You want, to, you want to pick up on George? I stopped thinking about Alex Smith a long time ago. The only time Alex Smith comes up in my world is when some fool on Twitter wants to talk about what his one loss record was as if he was out there playing cornerback, defensive tackle, and kicker in that game. I'm tired. Well, of we haven't had money. a chance to talk about it yet, so I wanted to finish it up. Excuse me. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about these these clowns on Twitter. And first of all, we got to stop <laughs> taking the temperature of the team's fan base by judging Twitter because Twitter is terrible. It is terrible. Yeah. It is a wasteland. I digress. <laughs> what is on my mind is so don't tweet out the huddle this no, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's why we don't have a Twitter handle. No, I'm kidding. You cannot, and Dave, you were there for this. How do you lose a game by slipping uh -huh. on a wet floor in Boston? It's not even the parquet, as Dave Preston is so uh, well in tune with. Dolly but, from South, he knows. But, I mean, come on, man. That, that, was so, that was so tough. And the Wizards have been on a roll. They have been, uh, it's been a feel-good story for them. Bye, Georgie. It's been a feel-good story for them. And uh, they've been on a roll. They're back in the playoff picture, or at least, you know, within shouting distance of it. And they had their season turned around. They had a winnable game right in their hands, and you slip on the baseline. I mean, it's just such a hard luck way to lose a game. And that was – I was sick to my stomach as I watched it, and I couldn't believe that that was the way that a game would end. And there's got to be some sort of – and look, and maybe this is me just uh, being, you know, reactionary or what have you. But – there's got to be some sort of rule in place where it's not a an actual turnover if a guy slips on a wet spot on the floor right. that you know what I'm saying like there's got to be a stoppage in play or something like that. I mean oh. it, that's that's just tough. The the bottom line as I said they, they should, look you are up by 5 with 46 seconds left in the NBA it's not over but you should win right. that game and the Wizards should have won that game. You know there's some argument that it's the basketball gods getting even with the Wizards yeah. because of what happened with the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, though, as a wizard yeah. scored six points in, in six seconds. And that brings up the argument. And you, you I understand both uh, sides of that. At that point, should the Wizards have called the timeout then and get settled? Because you know you're going to get ambushed in the backcourt, just like the Wizards what, ambushed the Nets. And that's now, what Scott Brooks said after the game. He's like, that's my bad. That's my fault. I should have called a timeout there. Right. And, and the, you know, he's not wrong. No. But you, you just hate to see a game decided right. by something like, a guy fell down on the play before and then sweat all over the place and then makes the guy uh, uh, slip with uh, basically with the game on the line. It's and because just, this team needs wins because yeah. between exactly. COVID and an early Climbing start, a big hole. yeah, it's, it's so uh, it's no longer going to be judged just on, on feel good stories. Having said that, what, what does and going through this journey is a couple games I'll point out and both losses, the response in the Clippers game after winning in overtime against the Lakers and having to play the Clippers less than 24 hours later and, and making it a five point game going to the fourth quarter. I've seen that act before where it could be a 20 point deficit going to the fourth quarter because of, of the fatigue. The, having said that against the Celtics, they had played at home against Minnesota the night before, but it was a home game that was linked with a four game road trip. So that home game <laughs> was a home game in word only it was just another stop they went from denver to dc to boston uh and they they keep responding and how they're doing it uh is getting everyone involved and i, I think we're seeing the the blueprint it's going to be beal and westbrook and then it's going to be fill in the blanks and you for i think this team to really be successful it needs to be beal westbrook bertons on a consistent basis because if he can do this 15 to 20 point business, which we believe he can be capable of, which is why he was signed to that contract. I have to say, that's what he's getting paid for. <laughs> right. Then it is uh, yeah. a fill in the blanks. And that's, that's how you, you win basketball games. Chris Gian. So I was covering the game Saturday night, the dominating performance against the Minnesota Timberwolves and <laughs> Scott Brooks post game. You know, he could have talked about Russell Westbrook and the historic, uh, feat that he accomplished in only 24 games with the triple doubles or Bradley Beal, another great performance. But no, he kind of singled out some bench players, namely Garrison Matthews, and told the story uh, about how Garrison Matthews during pre-draft workouts um, 
ran so much to the point out running so much to the point where everybody thought that his lungs were about to collapse. And basically Scott Brooks was saying, when you're in that position, you're not a superstar. There is no warm up time for you. There is no taking plays off. You have to go hard every single time. And I was really impressed with his effort. And uh, I, you know, shout out to coach Brooks here because I know I was one of the people who did it. Um, I know Frank Hanrahan, our colleague has been calling for maybe Scott Brooks to not be the head honcho, the head head coach of this team anymore. And uh, he has seemed to have righted the ship, even though they did lose that game against the Celtics. They were leading the entire time and just blew it at the very end there. So I I like what I have been seeing out of this team, not only just the bench players, but you know, the, the role players too. And Russ is playing back to back now. So that's kind of nice as well. Um, seeing him stretched out a little bit, getting a little bit of mid season form. Well, well, again, I'll say it again with whatever sport uh, firing coach is, is just a sugar pill unless it is time. And this is not time with, with the wizards. You, you fire a coach when you lose a locker room and it happens in all sports. It happens in business. We're so your boss, no longer his message is just not coming through for whatever reason, but that's, that's not the case, and it's evidenced by the team's response through, again, the shutdown for the pandemic was, was a big deal. Dave Preston, before we let you get back, I'm not even going to say the pool because you're working much too hard down there. Before we let you get back to the business of baseball, anything else burning on your mind as we close? Before the we dive back into uh, the work that we're doing for w, the WTOP app, we've got some features up and rolling this week. I think today I talked about the cubbing of Washington Cool thing to check on WTOP.com on the sports page. Uh, I'm going to dive into a little college hoops. It is March. I must be in March. And there's nothing quite like the madness before the madness with due to COVID. And a lot of uh, there's been a lot of scre- uh, schedules scrambled so far this winter. Three local conferences are having tournaments this week. You've got the Atlantic 10. George Mason and George Washington could collide in the second round. VCU is a second seed. They've slipped down the stretch there, uh, sort of on the bubble, so to speak, for getting an at-large berth. You look at the CAA, James Madison won the regular season for the first time since 1991 in the days of Lefty Drizel. They have a chance to make the tournament for the first time in almost a decade. You look at Navy, who's the number one seed in the uh, Patriot League. Navy has a chance to make the tournament for the first time this century. Those tournament games take place all this week. I'm looking forward to... uh, keeping an eye on those while I have my eye on the Nats down here. I was going to say, man, you just gave us the Beltway basketball beat all the way from Florida. (laughs) In in this this week's Beltway basketball beat, we also are going to unveil our annual rankings of Girl Scout cookies. Oh, look at this. And and, and that'll be available on the WTLP app, correct? A legend that will last a lunchtime. (laughs) And that'll be available on the WTLP app. Yes, so we'll look forward to that. So make sure you you download the app. That's all the time for us. We appreciate uh, Dave being down there in Florida. We appreciate the spring training coverage presented by Main Street Bank. For Rob, Rob Woodfork, Chris Chian, George Wallace, there's something called a sportscast to do, and Dave Preston in Florida with the Gators. I'm Dave Johnson. Thanks for watching. Break. Break. Hell yeah. Thanks, John.